Thank you, guys. I don't see pizza in the room yet. No reason to stop. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. This is just an example because it's from the paper. Um, so an example might be we're talking about the mechanics. So this is when we are implementing a game. We, we need, we're talking about how to implement the mechanics. So the mechanic here is what AI do we need? Um, and this question depends greatly on what game we're making. So say we're making a babysitting game for three to seven year olds. Um, there's some sort of hide and seek. Um, game here, so you said if we want to emphasize our exploration and discovery, not challenge, okay, because three to seven year olds probably don't have very good coordination or whatever, so challenge might be a bit above them, and we want them to just explore and discover uh, where this baby is in his house. Um, so what AI should the baby have? Well, we can go with really simple AI here. Things like just uh, a surprise animation, uh, fear animation, anticipation. Um, and in terms of where the baby is, um, we can just say if it's here, then it moves here after three seconds or something. Just really hard code the AI because it's not challenge if they find the baby. That's good. Um, and sometimes we may even want to move the baby into view so if they haven't seen the baby for a minute, just make a pop out from behind the wall or whatever. Um, and you want mechanics for talking to it and chasing it, whatever. So this probably is not what most of you would think about when you, you want to talk about stealth mechanics or uh, some sort of uh, stealth dynamic system. Um, but in the context of the three to seven year olds, the, the mechanics and dynamics change. Okay, so now we'll look at what you need for, uh, in the context of 7 to 12 year olds, so something like based on Rugrats, say. So now we can get more challenge and have um, narrative well as well, maybe, so there's some sort of uh, story going on. We can have levels, so each level you might have to find one of the babies. Um, maybe you have to, to keep the, the level clean. So uh, the babies might, as they move around, uh, they might um, make a mess and you have to go around. You can f see where they've been by seeing the mess and you have to clean it up as you try and find them. Um, so the AI then needs to manage uh, different types of emotions. Um, and something like dynamic paths, um, so maybe selecting uh, some random hiding spots, going from one random one to the other one, um, and maybe different babies have different preferences, like one of them likes hiding in the closet, but the other one likes something else. So there's patterns here that the players can pick up on as they become more efficient at the game. Uh, so yeah, now we're talking about 30, 13 to 35 year old men, some sort of high and seek mechanics, Okay, so now uh, we're talking about spies. Okay, so we're changing uh, the aesthetics and challenge. Uh, uh, challenge is the main aesthetic. We have fantasy and narrative as, as kind of secondary aesthetics. Um, so now the AI needs to be a lot more devious and needs to um, search for you. So and notice we've changed roles here from being the person who's searching, we're now the person who's hiding. Um, maybe the AI should uh, cooperate with each other, um, use torches to look into certain areas. Um, we don't really worry about expressiveness, so maybe they're all just the generic same model, they're all just the henchman character. Um, but I mean, it can be fun to add things like conversations which would fit into the narrative aesthetic. Um, and we have this kind of leveling system for the users, the players, so they, they get better at hiding. And um, they, so the AI needs to be a lot more complex here. It needs to take in things like lighting, information, line of sight, stuff like that. Okay, so you can see, basically as an example, the aesthetics we want to show um, or portray to the player 
uh, really affect the dynamics and the mechanics that we end up implementing. This is another example um, that uh, one of the authors of the paper came up with called Sissy Fight. So, yeah, basically, this is uh, simulating a schoolyard fight between some girls, high school girls. Um, and each player starts with 10 self esteem, and you have to get all the other players to zero. Um, and when there's only one or two left, then they win. Okay, so in this game, we've got a partial design uh, created already, and the object of this exercise is to think about how you can modify the design. So we say, okay, um, each player starts with three action cards, six target cards, and ten chips. So this is for a game up to seven players. So each target card is one of the other, other players, and each action card is one of three actions, and ten chips for your, uh, for your self-esteem. Okay, so then every round, um, each player picks an action and a target, from their hand, and then they put that down on the table. And then once everyone's put it down, you reveal simultaneously. Um, and if you're talking to people, you have to speak so that everyone else can hear you. You can't whisper and stuff. Um, and when you run out of chips, you're out. And when there's two people left, they win. So these are the types of actions you can have. There's a solo attack uh, action where whoever you targeted discards one chip. There's team attack, so in a team attack, if someone else targets that person as well, no matter how many other people, uh, the target has to discard two chips. Uh, but if, if no one else targets that person, then they don't discard any. And there's the defend action where the target has no meaning. Um, and if you were going to be attacked, you discard half the number of chips rounded down. And if no one actually attacks you, then you lose a chip. Okay, so these are all the actions you can do. So I guess uh, the, the point of this is to modify this so that we have a different genre of setting that would fit the mechanics, but would make it no longer about a schoolyard fight, it's something else. Um, and then adapt the game so that it fits that uh, subject matter. Uh, yeah, so this uh, relates to another uh, thing that I didn't actually cover. But uh, basically here we were supposed to bring out some tokens and you can play the game and uh, come up with uh, different aesthetic qualities. But say you, you just come up with some new aesthetic uh, qualities and say, oh, okay, we want it to be about challenge, or it's already a challenge. Uh, I don't know, more about I don't know, some other aesthetic, how do we modify the dynamics so that uh, we uh, include that aesthetic? And then, um, yeah, so I guess the point of this is an exercise in order to figure out how we can modify this so that we can fit the game to some new setting and genre as well as some new aesthetics. And that's the end. So it's something to think about. Uh, now if you want. What I find interesting about it is that because you're putting, fitting the language in the formal language, you have to first learn the language first, otherwise it's just going to take forever to communicate your ideas. Yeah. So you, learn, you learn the language, which is this, this structure and framework, and then yeah. it becomes easier to communicate. But until you learn it, it's really difficult. Like to talk in this way. Yeah. There's a learning curve. Because, because of the confusion with things like what aesthetic means and stuff like that. Yeah, it can be. Uh, but I mean, even talking in that language will take a while to get. Different. Yeah, but once you do it, it's yeah. a lot better. And then you've got a lot more people you can talk to. Yeah, because this is a, this is a very well uh, known um, paper. A lot of game designers know about this. So if you go to a job, say somewhere, and you want to be a game designer, you can talk about, like, they might ask, like, you to analyze some game 
and you can use 